Good evening, everyone. I'm here with Professor Molly Zahn, the University of Kansas. Uh, first, Molly, I just want to say thank you for a very stimulating lecture. Uh, I'm sure everyone enjoyed it. If you are joining us, this is now an opportunity to engage Professor Zahn uh, directly. What you need to do is go to the Q&A function, which is somewhere on the margins of your screen and mine, it's at the bottom, but just go to the Q&A and type in a question. And as questions come in, I will pose them to Professor Zahn and she can answer them. If you're not satisfied, you can come back and ask us a second uh, question or uh, come back with a nuanced uh, version. So while people are in the process of typing their questions in, let's, let's start. So one of the things that I wondered about as I listened to you is I thought you did a great job of making the point that the temple is contrafactual and it was expected to be built and then wasn't built. And so it's actually set in the past from the perspective of the reader. And that invites someone to use their imagination to think of this temple in utopian terms, to use the category you've given it. But that made me wonder about the halachot, uh, especially the Deuteronomistic material that starts in column 50 and goes to the end. And I was wondering, how do you see the, the ways in which this halakhic material functions in a utopian text? Is it, does it represent ideals for the community? Are they actually supposed to do these things? Some are pretty standard halachot. Uh, so how do you assess the halachot at the, the last part of this text? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, and it's, uh, I can say live now, it's, it's great to be with you all, even though I can't see any of you except for Dean Sterling. Um, and it's, it's just wonderful to be able to, to share my work with you. Um, so to answer your question, I think that the, the halachot are part of creating this world that the Temple Scroll is trying to create through the vision of the sacred space, but also the authors are, authors are drawing a, 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 a bigger picture. The vision incorporates not just the sacred space, but also Israel in the land. And so the, 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 the other legal material, some of it pertains directly to maintaining the sanctity and the purity of the temple and the purity of the communities, which is part of like what I think the utopian vision is. Um, and the other material, I think it's, I think it's, it's like it's prescriptive within the world of the vision, if that makes sense, that the entire thing creates a sort of world that would be an ideal um, functioning of an Israelite society or a, or a Jewish society, um, Israel and its land. I mean, certainly I, I presume that the authors of this text like believed that these halachot were the right ones. And insofar as they were engaged in debates in their contemporary society or you know, advocating or, or practicing different kinds of halachic perspectives that, that they would actually do some of these things. But I think um, it's, it's, it's part of the larger goal of the thing, which is to make people imagine a, a sort of world with the sacred space, but also with, the, um, with Israel and its land more broadly. Okay, so we've got a series of questions. So let me start posing questions from the audience. Thank you, Molly. Uh, the first question, I'd like to hear more about your views on the framing of the Temple Scroll, specifically its first person framing and how this squares with other Second Temple texts and what it might tell us about how the Temple Scroll expresses its aims. Right, I like the way that question is put. I mean, of course, the Temple Scroll makes almost the strongest kind of claim to divine revelation of anything that I can think of from the Second Temple period or even compared to you know, there's portions of the biblical text, right, where the, the Pentateuch, where, where God speaks in the first person directly to, to Moses and so forth. But the temple scroll is clearly being deliberate about that because it's, it's changing the material from Deuteronomy. I, I don't think I mentioned this explicitly in my talk, but um, 
when it takes material from Deuteronomy, which of course has Moses as the speaker, and, and, and so Moses refers to God in the third person, you know, when you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving to you, the temple scroll changes that, right? It says, when you come into the land that I am giving you. Um, so I take this to be, you know, it's, it's an authority claim, certainly, but it's also, I think, a, a claim for sort of immediacy and, and primacy that, that this, this was really, you know, if you think about the world that's being created, like by the, by the Temple Scrolls vision, this is the one that, that God, you know, this is the one that God expressed with God's own mouth, if you will. And so I think it does contribute to the, I don't know, the rightness of it, the, the, you know, that, that, that this is really what it was supposed to be. I think that's how I would, I would start to connect it with the framing. Okay. Uh, next question. In your study of the Temple Scroll, have you ever found any evidence that the author was familiar with either Hellenistic or Babylonian utopian ideas? Um, I don't know yet. I mean, that's a good question. I, I, I don't know of specifics yet. However, I think the ways that I would go to answer that question would really be to look at um, other constructions, especially of sacred space, especially on the sort of temple, the temple as, as microcosm or the temple as representing the cosmos. These are ideas that I know go way back in ancient Near Eastern and Mesopotamian framings. I'm less familiar with the Greek side, but I wonder if there aren't analogs there as well. Um, I wouldn't put it in terms of necessarily direct, like the authors knew of this thing, um, but that there was a common cultural currency. Um, and, you know, and I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't rule out a, a larger engagement with, with the Hellenistic world at the time. But, um, but I, I think especially in the sense of, of the sacred space as, as utopian, um, that's where I would, I would go to, to answer that. Okay. Next question. Shia Cohen has said that after crises, Jews construct alternate realities, not of the present or future, but of the past. I call this a past perfect, an alternative reality in the past that was not perfect. Leviticus, which reached final form in the post-destruction period, and the Mishnah are both such past perfects. These alternative realities have the positive function of creating communal memories and memories create communal identity. One might think the temple scroll might seem to be another such exercise in post-crisis creations of a past perfect. But what I hear you saying is that the temple scroll constructs a past imperfect. Very cool idea. This alternative reality is what should have been and never was. So the question is, why? You hinted that this is consistent with an anthropological pessimism. I wonder whether it might also be a theodicy. It never was because we failed in some way. Yeah, thank you. Um, that's a really, a really great question and a great way of putting it. And, and it leads me to, to mention that another, another piece of this puzzle with the scroll that I haven't yet really been able to engage with is, is the Mishnah and Tractate Midot and it's sort of, as, as you say, construction of this um, past ideal that no longer exists. Um, yeah, so the Temple Scroll says is similar, but the thing never happened, right? Um, you can't say, as you could say with Leviticus or with the Mishnah, oh, we had this thing way back when, because um, it clearly didn't happen ever that way. And anyone that's familiar with the tradition would have would have realized that I think um, I do think it's theodicy and I think the theodicy I don't I would see the theodicy as connected to the anthropological pessimism sort of two sides of the same coin like it's not it's not God's fault it's our fault um, and so I'm not sure you know in in the Deuteronomistic history there's kind of like, there's the sin, there's always the one thing or that, that you can point to that Israel is obedient and then they fall away. Um, and the temple scroll doesn't give us that. There is that 
you know, that passage in the law of the king that refers to, that uses kind of Leviticus 2060 language of, of you know, worshiping idols or whatever. Um, but I'm not sure what to make of that. And if, if I dare kind of build on that, flesh out that connection to Qumran anthropology, you know, at Qumran, it, people just don't, they don't have it. They don't, humans are incapable of not only behaving correctly, but even knowing what they should do to behave correctly. All, all knowledge comes from God, knowledge of right action. And it's at Qumran in the Hodeot, it's the knowledge of, it's the knowledge granted by God that allows the human being to rise out of their worm-like status, right? This like this very abased status. And so it's it's all, it's this very dramatic, I think defense of God, the only slight troubling of the picture would be they still have to reckon with if God is so powerful and everything comes from God, why does God continue to allow evil to persist? Um, why did God make humans this way in a way? And that's, you know, what the, what the two spirits treatise and the community rule tries to reckon with that God in his mystery allows the situation to pertain. Um, so, so yeah, I think theodicy definitely is part of the picture. And I think, I think it's probably connected in some way to this, this possible connection to what, what, you know, the anthropological pessimism. Thank you. Okay. We, we still have quite a few questions, so we're not going to run out. Um, I find quite fascinating this notion that the temple scroll might be offering a kind of pathway for contemplative ascent. I'm wondering whether you imagine this as a contemplative practice performed by an individual reader or a communal practice of some kind. Um, very good question. Um, as with so many things, temp Second Temple, we don't know. I mean, we don't we don't have the reception histories of these texts that we would like to. Um, I we know we do have evidence for communal practices of liturgical communion with the angels in the songs of the Sabbath sacrifice from Qumran. It's it's complicated people argue about what exactly is going on what kind of what kind of mystical experience or what kind of ascent is 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 happening um and we also know from Qumran a lot of stuff about communal study and and meditate meditation is maybe the wrong word but but communal prayer and and study does that mean nobody ever did it individually I don't know um or like, no, it does not mean nobody ever did it individually. I There are fewer exemplars that I can think of for individual contemplation in that sense. Um, and perhaps the communal nature of the text, like it's not that concerned with the individual. Um, and so that might be a clue that maybe a, a communal kind of setting is, is more where we would look for this to be situated. Okay. I, I want to follow with just one little footnote of a question, <clears throat> because we know that they were reading at least the descriptions. We assume they're reading some things in common at Qumran, but you suggested the text is not sectarian, so it may have come from outside of Qumran to Qumran, presumably something like the Genesis Apocrypha. Uh, so where else might you assume that a text like this would have been read? Well, thank you. And I meant to say I had it in my head to, 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 to gloss that and say, well, of course, we can't assume that the practices at Qumran are what happened everywhere. Um, but that's where we have the evidence from, right? Um, so, I mean, the problem is we don't know enough about the social groups at that time, right? And I, um, it's, it's obviously a priestly text. I mean, the, the people who put this thing together have got to be connected with the priesthood in some way. Um, they are very kind of pro-Levite. Um, Jeff Stackert has a nice article on this. And, and, you know, and this is another area where like I need to do more work. But um, there's a, so they're, they're located in conversations about, about the priesthood and about the temple. Um, it was suggested to me at one point that you know, maybe this somehow comes out of some kind of response to 
you know, Herod's building program, the discussions about renovating the temple that would have happened in the, you know, in the in the in the first century. The problem is it's 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 probably earlier than that. And it's probably it's not sectarian in terms of its content as far as we can see. It also, if we take the manuscript dates as anything, you know, if there's really a, a mid 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 second century manuscript of it, then it, it definitely predates the settlement of the community at Qumran. And so um, but I think it's reasonable to, to think that these may be the kinds of groups that, you know, from which the Yahad, as we see it at Qumran, might have ultimately emerged. Um, so we can kind of triangulate some things about social matrix, but it's, you know, this is a text that really doesn't, doesn't want to give us that information. So. All right. So the next question is actually directly related, and it was in two parts, and I think I think you've just answered part one, but you can decide whether you want to say anything more. Uh, but part two is certainly fresh. Where do you come down on the vexed question of the sectarian provenance of the temple scroll, which is what you've answered in part? And related to that, how do you imagine the text of the temple scroll to have been performed at Qumran, where it certainly resided? Yeah, excellent. Excellent question. Um, I think, I mean, I don't, you know, people, Yadin assumed it was sectarian. Um, people have tended to, you know, argue that it's not sectarian because it doesn't contain particular sectarian terminology. It certainly doesn't imagine the kinds of divisions within Israel that you find in sectarian texts, right? Like where the the sons of light are a, a subset of, of Israel and why, well, you know, they're the true Israel, but there's no such language of a sort of dichotomy or, or subset in the temple scroll, which is one clue that it, it comes from some kind of broader context. Um, while still sharing, you know, this is where I get back to that sort of early, you know, somewhere in the prehistory of the movement, similar to Jubilees, um, with which it shares some things, but not others, but you know, the, the presence of the calendar that we otherwise know of from Qumran. Um, and the question of performance is honestly one that I've not, oh, one more thing on the sectarian, but it's, you know, it's only recently that I've really started to, to see more connections with the sectarians than I had before in terms of how, like, what is this really implying about people in the world and, and God and, you know, the future? Um, so that, of course, could just be an indication of why the text was popular at, you know, was used at Qumran. Um, I honestly haven't thought much about this question of performance. Um, it's, you know, so it's, it did kind of strike me very fleetingly the other day, like, is this, was this another, another option alongside, you know, alongside the sort of community itself as, as, sanctuary like we find in the in the the seraph is this is this possibly another model that would have been current in the community that maybe some particularly priestly oriented members might have found helpful for contemplation or visioning you know what is it that you know obviously having a temple is is critical to these people um while we don't have any temple, we can sort of do this thing in real life where we create a holy space through worship, but maybe another part of it was like imagining this space that is what should be there right now, but, but isn't. Um, I guess that's where I'd start to think about that one further, but that's an excellent question. Okay. Well, it's the, the whole point of having questions is to provoke you to think a little bit more. So uh, next question. Um, when you define utopian as you do, what biblical text in your mind don't fall into that category? Are any purely descriptive of the world around them rather than attempting to bring about a better world? I mean, probably not. Probably there are no legal texts that are not attempting to bring about a better world. Um, and chronicles, 
I think Schweitzer has, you know, makes a good argument that that reading chronicles through the lens of utopia, or at least imagining a better world, right? Critiquing the status quo through imagining something other. Um, You know, I'm not sure I would see wisdom texts as necessarily utopian in the sense of imagining a different world. I'm not sure. I'm not sure the Deuteronomistic history does that. It seems to me that it's more interested in kind of explaining where things went wrong. And, and like, yes, by contrast, I, mean, I can see how you could kind of imagine a contrasting figure of the ideal that should have been before they, you know, the kings messed up, and you know, um, so I, you know, even in my quite expansive definition, um, I think it's it's not everything. Okay. Have you found any parallels between the utopian idea and the temple scroll, and the theoretical discussions of sacrifice and the temple in rabbinic literature? Um. The short answer is I still need to look at that in detail. Um, and I know there's work I've started to, I think I have a list of bibliography going, but this is really one of the next issues I want to address is, um, because as, as Christine brought out in her earlier question, I'm sorry, I'm looking at who the questions are by, because it just helps me imagine um, when, that I'm talking to, to more people than just Greg. Um, but, you know, that question about what, or, you know, the reference to the Mishnah, um, yeah, I think similar things are going on. Um, so I think there's a lot, you know, the, the short answer is, is yes, and I'm not at a point, I assume that the parallels are there and I'm not at a point of being able to articulate them in a coherent way. Okay. If somebody has one last question, please type it in quickly and we can take one more question, but we're going to... Uh, wrap this up pretty quickly. Molly, I, while we're giving people one chance, just a little quick question. Steve Schweitzer's point about the chronicler and his argument is that it's a critique. So if you think of the temple scroll, now I'm thinking of it coming from people at Qumran or at least how they might have seen it. There is a critique of the existing temple. So do you want to just Think about that a little bit, unpack that. You didn't really play that up. You were offering a much more positive vision of the future or not of the future, positive vision rather than a critique. But does it, does it have a negative function as well? Oh yeah, definitely. And I think the critique element is very, is very, it's like it's implicit. And so people use this language of it's ironic, it's not polemical, it's not saying like we hate the temple, but you're saying that God commanded this thing, you know, from Sinai in God's own like first person voice, and nobody ever built it. And, you know, that's as true for Solomon's temple. You know, Solomon's temple didn't have a gigantic outer court that, you know, and was arranged like the desert camp, like it, it wasn't that. Um, and the, the second temple certainly wasn't that. And so I think the critique is, is implicit, but it is definitely there. Um, and, 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 and that's why it can tie in with the, you know, it, it doesn't have to tie in specifically with the dissatisfaction of the Qumranites, but I think it definitely, um, there's definitely a, a connection there and, and definitely it's a rejection of the status quo. It's saying, this is not what God intended. Yeah, it, it is a bigger temple than the Herodian temple, not by a huge amount, but it's bigger. Well, but, there's, a, there's a famous, I mean, I don't know, it's famous to temple scroll people. Magin, Magin Broshi, Broshi wrote a, an article back in the 80s where he kind of mapped the plan of the temple on, of the temple scroll onto the temple mount in Jerusalem. And like, you can't, you can't do it. You'd have to fill in the whole Kidron Valley, or you'd have to, um, you know, go into the, the city to the, to the west and you know it's it's like it doesn't it's 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 much bigger than the physical space of the temple mount yeah I, I mean it just makes me wonder if it's critical of that particular temple but anyway i i hope all of you wherever you are at will join me in thanking molly zahn for a very stimulating lecture on the temple scroll for thinking about utopian ideas in the hebrew bible 
and in Second Temple Judaism. But thank you, Molly. Uh, it was very stimulating and we appreciate the presentation a great deal. Thank you. Thank you all for your great questions. Good night, everyone.